Hello, I'm Brent Jensen here at Edmonton Global and thank you for joining us today. The purpose of Edmonton Global is to radically transform and grow the economy of the Edmonton metropolitan region. The work we do promotes the region globally and focuses on attracting and retaining business investments and trade right here. Today we're welcoming a conversation to increase awareness around the economic opportunities in global aerospace supply chains with the world's largest aerospace provider, Airbus. Airbus has a long history of working in Canada and with Canadian companies. Currently working with more than 665 Canadian suppliers across nine provinces, Airbus sources more than 1.8 billion Canadian dollars annually from Canadian companies. They're a front runner for innovation and skills in Canada with 24 active ongoing projects with Canadian expertise clusters related to artificial intelligence, autonomous flight, materials, electrification, and pluridisciplinary research projects with the National Research Councils with applications to, into aerospace. To further help our understanding of how the Edmonton Metropolitan Region companies can identify opportunities and become part of Airbus's supply chain, I welcome the esteemed Mr. Holger Heckel. Holger is president and founder of Avera Consulting here in Alberta with extensive experience in working with and servicing Airbus. At the conclusion of Holger's presentation, we'll have plenty of time for questions from our audience. So pay close attention and remember to jot down your thoughts and queries into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. With no further ado, I'll hand the time over to my good friend Holger. Holger, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Brent. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, uh, to tell you a little bit more about the opportunities within the global Airbus and aerospace supply chain. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Holger Heckel. I'm uh, an industrial engineer. Please don't hold that against me. I, I uh, hail from Germany, Munich. Uh, I have about 30 years of, of professional experience in a variety of industries, and uh, that includes the operational excellence and, of course, the the Airbus, uh, the Airbus supply chain. Uh, I immigrated to Canada in 99. I founded the, uh, uh, my own consulting firm, Avera. And uh, uh, I'm, also, I'm also a senior consultant for Air Business Academy, which is an Airbus company out of Toulouse in France. So at Air Business Academy, we're supporting suppliers throughout uh, the uh, global aerospace and aviation industry, and more specifically, of course, within the, within the Airbus supply chain. In addition, I'm also a senior advisor for Staufen. Uh, that's the operational excellence uh, site. It's one of Europe's leading consulting firms um, with offices in Germany, Switzerland, China, Brazil, and most recently, the US. Uh, also, I wanted to say in, uh, between 2005 and 15, in my spare time, I, uh, I, I spend a significant amount uh, of hours as a crew member on, on cargo planes, um, transporting high value goods between, uh, between uh, Canada and Europe. And believe me, there's nothing better than breaking through the clouds, uh, flying jump seat on a 747, although that's a Boeing uh, product. So, we think it's never too late to find your way into the aerospace supply chain. And yes, it is a difficult, it's a, it's a difficult industry at the moment. Uh, uh, we see a lot of uh, aviation companies uh, failing or about to fail. Uh, but when we look at the orders and, and the order backlog that, that we still have, and these are the numbers these are the numbers that are very current. So uh, March, end of March, 2021. Uh, at Airbus, there's still a full order book. Um, the order book has declined a little bit. We didn't see that many, that many uh, uh, new orders as in previous years. But uh, when we look at it, we still have at Airbus, uh, there's still roughly 7,000 aircraft on order and still to be built. Uh, and that translates into a production backlog anywhere between eight and 12 years, depending on the, depending on the program. And as Brent already mentioned it, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, don't get me wrong, Boeing has uh, great aircraft. Uh, they're certainly a leader uh, just as, as well as Airbus. Uh, but when we compare the order books, uh, we have, uh, uh, based on list price we have on the Airbus side, we have almost a trillion dollars 
um, on our order book, uh, well, that's significantly less with, uh, with Boeing for various reasons. Um, one, th one thing here on, on, this, on this slide I wanted to point out because we're gonna come later to that. Uh, uh, we really have to look uh, at the, the, we have to distinguish between narrow bodies and wide bodies. Uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has, uh, has uh, uncovered some, uh, some new patterns uh, that we see and we will see that uh, uh, the approach that Airbus took in, uh, Airbus is clearly a leader in the, in the narrow body market, um, um, that that has great potential to pay off in the, in, in the future uh, to, uh, based on, on changes in travel patterns. So um, one thing that when we talk about the one trillion one trillion dollar in in order volume, uh, one thing we have to take into consideration is that depending on the program, uh, there's a significant portion of the aircraft value is actually being generated in the aerospace supply chain. So it's uh, this, uh, for instance, on the A three hundred and fifty, up to eighty percent of the value of an aircraft comes from the supply chain. So it's not that we have to imagine there's a huge factory in Toulouse where, where aircraft are, are assembled. There's, there's assembly lines, final assembly lines, but the components and the parts and the materials, the, those are all coming from the, from the supply chain. So there's uh, that $1 trillion, $1 trillion uh, uh, over the next, let's say 10, 11 years, up to 80% comes from the, from the supply chain. And what we're focusing today here on in this in this webinar is uh, in 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 the brevity of this uh, of the time that we have is we focus on um, opportunities in in two dimensions. One is what is it that we build, and the other component is how do we build it, and and the requirements for those are are quite uh, quite different. Um, so let's first uh, focus on what we built and. One thing to really understand is that innovation is a key component for, for continued success, not only for Airbus, but also in the Airbus supply chain. One thing that uh, Airbus uh, is critically looking at when, when Airbus procurement talks with, with suppliers, it's, it's not about, um, you know, Airbus procurement gets a lot of, a lot of proposals on, let's say, for simplicity's sake, Company ABC, we drill holes into 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 metal, and uh, but our competitive advantage is that the holes we drill are so much rounder than the other ones from competitors, and that's not what Airbus is looking for. Airbus is looking for innovation, and uh, aside from the usual suspects, of course, quality, uh, performance and cost quality, that's non-negotiable. You have to have a quality management system in place and you we have to deliver, any supplier has to deliver 100% quality um, because if something goes wrong, we can't just pull over at 35,000 feet. Um, so quality, non-negotiable performance, very, very important that as a supplier, you meet on-time deliveries. Uh, um, you don't want to be, we don't want to, Airbus does not want to see a supplier even deep down in the supply chain holding up the, the final assembly line. And then we talk about cost. Uh, well, I'm not saying cost is not important to Airbus, but it's not the most important driver. The most important driver is really innovation that allows Airbus to further defend its competitive advantage against the competition. And the competition is not only, is not only Boeing, but the competition is also in China um, where we see the biggest uh, growth, uh, the largest growth in, in, in aviation uh, in terms of flying passengers. And uh, um, that's something that Airbus and Boeing have to be are, are aware of that we have to uh, be really, really careful in what we do and that we have a products bring it, that we bring products to the market that convince through innovation. And, and so it's not about, it's not about making the cheapest parts or, or uh, it, it is about, it is about 
fuel efficiency. It is about uh, it is about the, the uh, environmental impact uh, that that we generate, and it is about uh, carbon neutral production and operation of aircraft. So keep that in mind uh, when we talk about becoming an Airbus or an aerospace supplier. It's about the innovation for, especially in in our market, in our market here. So what we built, uh, as we've seen through the pandemic, the uh, changes in consumer behavior and public health regulations are impacted airlines requirements. So up until the pandemic, uh, we were talking uh, in, in the supply chain, we were talking a lot about how can we meet, uh, how can we produce more aircraft? We have such a high demand uh, in, in, in travel, uh, People are traveling for pleasure or for, for business, and that just keeps on growing, growing, growing. Um, so the question pre-pandemic was, how can we meet those, uh, those production rates? How can we, as suppliers, how, can we, how can, can we do that? Now, all of a sudden, through the pandemic, those requirements coming from airlines are no longer when can we get more aircraft? Uh, those requirements are different. The uh, airlines are asking for a more flexible use of, of aircraft. Um, they're asking for, for cost reduction in, in, uh, in, in operating costs. And, and that has, uh, we see that uh, it was a development that we've seen already in the past, slowly, slowly ramping up. But now we clearly see the picture evolve that we're going, the industry is going away from a hub and spoke uh, system uh, to a point to point. Um, and uh, uh, with all credit to Boeing, Boeing uh, already caught that uh, development uh, ahead of Airbus. Uh, However, we'll see where we stand now just in a minute. So what do we mean by hub and spoke and point to point? As an example, let's say we're in Halifax and I want to travel to Toulouse uh, because I have an important meeting with, uh, with Airbus procurement in France uh, at the uh, head office in Toulouse. So if I'm in Halifax uh, on a hub and spoke system, I, of course I have to travel back to Toronto, uh, then flying to Frankfurt, and then from Frankfurt into, into Toulouse. So on two of those three legs uh, of the journey, I'm, I'm going in the wrong direction. And uh, I'm covering a total of 4,600 nautical miles, whereas if I was to be able to go point to point from Halifax into Toulouse, um, that's a much shorter distance. Uh, so, and in, as a matter of fact, I would uh, I would burn 40 41% less fuel on a on a passage per passenger basis. So that of course means why is the hub and spoke system in place because we have big aircraft going from Toronto into Frankfurt and what could be done what could be done differently. So airlines are asking for increased flexibility and of course it's so much easier for airlines to fill up a smaller aircraft that by the way operates at a much lower per passenger cost than cramping 300, 400 people into, into a, a large aircraft. And this is not only the 777, it's, it's also the, of course, the Airbus A380 uh, or, or even, even the uh, an Airbus A330. But so the development goes into smaller aircraft, single aisle aircraft, that offer an increased flexibility. And of course, the question is, well, but Holger, can you go, can you go with, a, with a single aisle aircraft? This is just uh, uh, for short or medium distance. Can you go across the pond with that? And that's exactly, that's exactly what happened already. Airbus has, is already well positioned to respond to those new requirements. And we even have a Canadian, a very Canadian perspective uh, to that. So at Airbus, there's two, uh, there's two product families. Uh, one is the A220, um, great Canadian product. It's a great aircraft um, uh, developed by Bombardier. And uh, so we see Canadian ingenuity right there. Uh, however, there's there's a few issues that with that aircraft or with the production of that aircraft that I'll come to in a minute. And we have the uh, the European 
the European uh, component in that, that's the A320 family. And uh, as a most recent development, the A321 XLR for extra long range, uh, that aircraft is going into service in 2023. We're well underway. Uh, there's no, there's, so far, there's no disruption uh, for the development of that aircraft because it builds on an existing aircraft. And that aircraft has actually uh, the range to, to um, serve a market that takes you from even from Toronto into, into Europe on a single aisle aircraft. And the beauty about that is you can operate that single aisle aircraft because we're not going to see that many passengers traveling from Halifax into Toulouse. You can operate that same aircraft on the very next day going from Halifax into Toronto on a, on a, on a short haul flight. So that's the flexibility we can we can that Airbus brings to the market, and uh, that's where even with the latest uh, program at Boeing, uh, that's not there yet, and uh, uh, that's the only option that Air, uh, that Boeing offers in that for that market. So so we do think that Airbus is very well positioned, very well positioned for for those future requirements, but of course we also have to think about. What impact is that going to have on the environment? If if we um, and it was already pre-pandemic that uh, delivery flights uh, were were uh, uh, being done with sustainable aviation fuels, so from non-fossil uh, uh, and or organic matter uh, uh, generated fuel in into the aircraft. But what changed through the pandemic was as in this example here, uh, the French government, French government uh, early on provided the financial aid package to the to the aviation and, and aerospace industry in France, where Airbus is, of course, uh, has its head office. Um, and the French government said, "Okay, we're going to give that 15 billion euro uh, to to the aviation industry, but in return for that, we want to see we want to see a, a, a better commitment, a larger commitment of the industry to decarbonizing the um, that that industry. So the goal is there to to reach decarbonization by 2035. And uh, just a few months later, Airbus announced the." Uh, uh, zero E zero emission uh, initiative, uh, where that simply deals with uh, how can we use uh, hydrogen on the aircraft uh, and that being used either for combustion or for generating electrical power in fuel cells. So we think about okay, twenty thirty five. That's still far out, right? Uh, but then you have to take into consideration the typical aircraft development timeline is about ten years. So if we go back from 2035, so we'd have to get started with development uh, in 2025. And that is really just around, around the corner. And when we look at what's happening or what Airbus already has is we have, there's current, the current aircraft, we have the Canadian A220, we have uh, um, um, on the turboprop side, we have an ATR-72. The announcement that Airbus made for the for the Zero E initiative is really they're developing a turbofan, uh, and that is mainly that is mainly uh, uh, combustion. So we're burning we're burning hydrogen instead of instead of uh, jet fuel, and uh, the second model was it's the turboprop for shorter distance. Um, that's there. We're talking. We're talking electric propulsion. So think fuel cell. And then there's a, a, a new study where Airbus took the liberty of rethinking of what we've done so far in in about hundred years of of, uh, of aircraft development and said, okay, uh, how, can we work with a blended wing body? So there's no counterpart. Uh, there's no counterpart on the current current site of, of aircraft but that gives you a picture of where the where the industry or where those development might go and what it means for a turbofan what would be the the existing model that could serve as a as a as a baseline where that turbofan could develop 
into. So, so great opportunities, we think, uh, for, for the A220 here in Canada. And of course, also, we have to take into consideration when we talk about uh, hydrogen aircraft, we have to take into consideration what's happening on the infrastructure side. Uh, hydrogen is much more difficult to handle than uh, than jet fuel. Uh, so there's still there's still lots of there's still lots of challenges to to be solved in order to reach to reach that that goal. So and in other terms, in, in uh, uh, the other the other aspect that we have to look at is we have to think about how we build, and that's also based on the pandemic. Uh, um, the suppliers' priorities are changing in response to disruption. They always have changed uh, in in uh, uh, to to disruption, and COVID is not the only disruption that that the supply chain has seen. Um, but what we see in this picture that was provided by Roland Berger Consulting, it's it's uh, the, the always at the top of the mind of suppliers was the manufacturing side. How we're gonna build parts, what are we gonna, what are we gonna build, what can we develop, and how do we make how do we make a, a good profit on the uh, uh, in in doing so. Now what we've seen within uh, base, through uh, through uh, COVID, we've seen that the, the priority for the supply chain as that has, has changed dramatically because all of a sudden we have we have supply chains that are failing or missing parts and uh, that's uh, that always uh, causes trouble in an in an aerospace in an aerospace supply chain and it, as soon as there's the risk of of suppliers individual suppliers failing in the supply chain uh, the, the alarms go off at the final assembly line in, in Toulouse or in, in, uh, uh, in Mirabel and asking, okay, what impact is that gonna have for, for our final assembly line? And therefore, um, there's a lot of focus, there has been a lot of focus on digital transformation uh, within the Airbus supply chain that digital transformation is expected to increase the visibility and more recently, the flexibility within the Airbus supply chain. Remember, it was always like, okay, we know exactly we're gonna build 70 or 60 A320s uh, in a month. Um, and that will go on year after year after year. That has that has changed. Uh, airlines are, are have different requirements. Uh, they're saying, well, yeah, we're still going to take those aircraft, but uh, can we have them later, uh, or can we have them in a different configuration? So, so we need more flexibility within the Airbus supply chain. And for Airbus, that meant uh, early on, uh, Airbus started with a digitization and digital transformation. And what's the difference? We think that really we have to focus on digital transformation where we rethink our business models and we rethink other ways, the way we do business in, in the aviation industry and what can Airbus offer to, to uh, their customers. So that means that there's already been a significant amount of money in and spent on development of, of digital transformation uh, uh, services, new services uh, within, within Airbus. But when we look at the supply chain, we see a difference between A350-1000 and a very old, uh, a very old propeller aircraft. So, and the supply chain, and the deeper we go into the supply chain, and I'm not talking about the biggest suppliers. I'm talking about the tier three suppliers, the tier four suppliers deep in the supply chain who still run partially their production planning, not on an SAP system, but on Excel. Just a few years ago, we had that, we had that, uh, uh, that scenario where we had a, a tier three supplier holding up the holding up the uh, the final assembly line in Toulouse uh, because they couldn't deliver they couldn't deliver product. And when we took a closer look, it was oh yeah, they ran their their production planning. They run ran that with Excel. 
and a printout, a daily printout. And uh, uh, so that's not really that's not really what uh, uh, what state of the art. And Airbus decided to take a closer look of what's happening deeper down in the supply chain and quickly realized, okay, we have isolated and limited solutions. Uh, not everybody using using Excel. There's, of course, there's ERP systems out there and there's MRP systems out there, but the, there's a lack of integration and, and suppliers don't necessarily sh share that knowledge uh, with each other. So th it's a huge almost like a huge black box where we don't, where Airbus procurement or where Airbus does not know what's what's actually happening in the in the supply chain in terms of planning, in terms of visibility and what impact that might have if we have, if we need to change the production or the, the assembly of an aircraft uh, in the time frame. So what does that mean for the supplier? That's really, Airbus shares all that a lot of information with its suppliers, but what's actually happening within the supply chain, there's there's so much room for improvement um, uh, that we really need to get our hands on. And this is, COVID shows us, or the pandemic shows us that Airbus can no longer work with that uncertainty of what's happening in the, in the supply chain. So, and that also means, of course, it does not mean uh, we're advocating that for even the smallest supplier to get uh, SAP or a massive ERP system. It's more about the interconnectivity between between suppliers and from suppliers into into Airbus. And how can we do better forecasting? How can we use machine learning to detect patterns? Uh, uh, how can we how can we use machine learning in in the operation of an aircraft in terms of the three D printing? Uh, can we can we capture can we capture data while that aircraft is on the flight and have the uh, the replacement part ready at the destination airport uh, for for uh, a supplier to to uh, deliver uh, the, the missing component? So it's the integration and the and the collaboration within within the within the supply chain that needs to uh, that needs more improvement. So and again, I already touched on the uh, Canadian perspective, which we clearly have. We we have uh, here is just a, a, a picture or, or a view on the A220 uh, out of out of Mirabel. Uh, again, great aircraft. Um, it's too expensive. Um, too expensive based on 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 supplier selection. Uh, typically, we have on, on this program we have uh, two final assembly lines, but we have more more than cl or close to a thousand uh, suppliers on on that single on that single aircraft, and and that's just uh, um, it's a little bit uh, um, the way Bombardier was thinking when they selected suppliers is, differs a little bit from from what Airbus does. So what Bombardier did was they actually uh, came up with, uh, in terms of automotive industry, they came up with a with a great sports car. Right, it has all the bells and whistles. It's a fantastic aircraft. Performs fabulously. Fuel efficient. Everything an aircraft, uh, an airline would ask for. But it's too expensive. There's some risks or significant risks in the in the in the supply chain. And uh, uh, there's single sourcing being done. Uh, there's uh, specific materials that only that are only uh, 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 used on the A220 and nowhere else. Um, that's good for the supplier, but it's 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 not good for it's not good for Airbus. And and Airbus Europe comes in and says, okay, as the name implies, uh, we're not really good at manufacturing or assembling uh, sports cars. We're good at Airbus. We're, we're good at, you know, standardized product, A320 with a, a few variants and, uh, and, and we're really good at that. So what's happening at the moment is we need to simplify the supply chain. We need to make sure that the supplier requirements are cascaded into the supply chain and may, we need to make sure that we have more flexibility and we have the supply chain resilience that 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 is so much required in this in this market. So, so great opportunity for for the uh, 
uh, stabilizing stabilizing the the airspace uh, the the A two twenty supply chain, which by the way, the A220 and the A320, so the single aisle programs, what are their bus, are the only programs that are ramping up at the moment. Granted, the A220 is ramping up from a very low level. Uh, we're currently at, at four a month. Uh, and uh, at this time, uh, Airbus is still still Airbus is still expecting to run that program at the deficit into 2025, but that program is ramping up. So that, of course, means uh, the more aircraft, uh, the more opportunities for for uh, new and, and potential suppliers to to provide solutions to that. Again, think in this term, in this context, think about how we build, right? So what can we, what can we uh, uh, contribute as a, as a potential supplier? What can you contribute to, to turn those red dots uh, in terms of process and cost? Uh, what can we do to, um, to turn those into, into, green, into green lights? And again, I talked about cost is not the most important uh, issue for, uh, or the most important criteria for Airbus procurement, but the cost in this scenario for the A220 is simply based on how the supply chain is is organized and how that how that works. Too many too many suppliers uh, uh, need to that needs to be simplified, or if it can't be simplified. Uh, or we can't if we can't reduce the numbers. We have to make sure that we don't get delays uh, based on or due to lack of information flow going back and forth uh, between those suppliers. So great opportunities. And there's another there's another opportunity uh, specifically for for uh, Canadian for Canadian small and medium sized enterprises. As you might have heard the. Uh, um, the tanker aircraft, Canada's strategic tanker transport capability, uh, it opens up those opportunities. It's, it's, a, it's a project uh, of, we're talking replacement of five existing aircraft. Uh, that project is worth about $5 billion uh, Canadian. And uh, currently, it's uh, it's an Airbus. Uh, that's a fleet of Airbus aircraft. That includes also the uh, VIP version that uh, our Prime Minister uh, is using for for travel. So we have uh, uh, two tankers, uh, two transport aircraft, and one VIP version of that. Uh, those aircraft uh, need to be replaced. Uh, they they reach they're slowly reaching their end of life. And hence the uh, procurement process was started in December, in December uh, last year. And uh, um, there's not too many, there's not too many companies, there's not too many companies who provide that kind of kind of product. Um, there's uh, of course Mr. B out of Seattle, and uh, there's uh, Airbus uh, with uh, with the existing with the existing aircraft. Um, the and in just in April, and this was not a although it was on April first, it, it was not an April Fool's joke. Uh, um, the only qualified bidder for this for this project is actually is Airbus. So uh, uh, and that makes sense uh, uh, to for from an operational point of view to go from an A three ten into an A three thirty. Uh, with with its tremendous capabilities. So so what that means for the for the process, um, the uh, the in, uh, initial operational capability of, of this of this project, uh, um, the Royal Canadian Air Force uh, needs that that fleet by 2028, and of course uh, that means for the for 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 the. Uh, um, Kickoff of the project is actually the implementation starts in 2022, so next year. And uh, unless unless the uh, Canadian government decides to not go ahead with 
the entire project, which would then raise the question, and what are you going to do then if you do that? Because uh, uh, the existing fleet uh, has reached the end of its life cycle. Um, plus, they ran the uh, VIP version into a wall just last year. Um, so uh, that means uh, from an implementation point of view, in 2022, we'll have more activity from Airbus uh, looking for potential suppliers, not for the A330, but for Airbus in its entirety. Why is that? The reason for that is simply the ITB policy, Canada's, uh, uh, Canada's industrial and technological benefits policy. In short, that really is, we have a volume of $5 billion Canadian that, uh, um, that Airbus is very likely uh, being awarded. And Airbus commits in return to source products and services in Canada for Airbus in the exact same amount. Now, there's different aspects to it. Uh, so, so essentially Airbus has to purchase $5 billion worth of goods and services within Canada. Um, there's, a, there's a method on how to, how, to, uh, how to exactly calculate that. As an example, uh, if, if Airbus decides to purchase, uh, purchase components, uh, uh, mechanical parts, uh, in Canada, that means one dollar is equals one dollar. If Airbus decides to join a joint venture with with uh, uh, with a Canadian company uh, to provide in 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 service support, for example, the A330 fleet, a joint venture is valued higher. Uh, the same goes for uh, uh, um, research and development. Those values are are seen higher to because they offer a, a higher value to the Canadian, to the Canadian economy. And, and the way that's being calculated is uh, in, in, within the value proposition in the context of ITB, there's value propositions in that context. There's another value proposition I'll talk uh, in a few minutes uh, in terms of suppliers, but the value proposition uh, in that context means what if, if Canada awards this project to, to Airbus, what's the value that Airbus can provide to Canada? And that goes aside from the capabilities, the technical capabilities of that aircraft. And, and of course, uh, the Canadian government is looking at cost, but as a third element, um, the Canadian government looks also at this value proposition that Airbus can, can provide. And for that, Airbus is looking for potential suppliers uh, in a field of what the Canadian government calls key industrial capabilities. And there we have to distinguish between established technologies, of course, the usual suspects, aerospace systems and components, uh, defense systems, integration, uh, infrared training and simulation, but also in-service support. So meaning, uh, uh, do we have suppliers here in Canada that can provide uh, services when it comes to to keep uh, keep that fleet uh, running so that's goes into MRO uh, maintenance repair repair and overhaul but also emerging techno emerging technologies so innovation in advanced materials artificial intelligence cyber resilience uh, remote piloted systems and we've seen the, over the last few months we've seen already very encouraging uh, developments coming out of out of Alberta um, and also space systems so just to name name a few those are those are really the, the the that's what Airbus will be looking for in potential suppliers do you have something that where you can provide, where you can provide a product or service that is a innovative, and and uh, does it match those key industrial capabilities, right? So now five billion dollars. I just have to move my window here. So five billion dollars in terms of in terms of volume that where Canadian suppliers. Uh, 
could, uh, could, could that, that's opportunities where Canadian suppliers could, could enter the Airbus supply chain. And by the way, of course, this is only for Canadian suppliers. So this is not our friends south of the border where Airbus sources a lot of, a lot of uh, product and services already. So um, this is strictly Canadian. However, participation in the Airbus supply chain has of course high entry requirements. We're talking aircraft, we're talking, we're talking transportation of, of, of uh, people. And we all know what happens when, when an aircraft uh, falls out of the air. So um, those entry requirements, you have, there's several layers of that. Uh, um, as already pointed out, in one of the first slide, quality always, uh, that's non-negotiable. You have to have a quality management process in place, but also industrial production, you need to be on time. You have to have a good, uh, good measure, uh, good measures for industrial production. Um, in terms of lean production and continuous improvement, um, um, but also what does your supply chain look like? How do you procure your your materials and your components that are you that that you are are drawing from from your supply chain? And uh, uh, one thing to be aware of: we have cascading requirements. So one might say, and we come across that quite often, is a supplier might say, "Okay, well, uh, I'm only a small supplier somewhere down deep, deep down in the supply chain. What do I care about Airbus?" Uh, the Airbus requirements. These requirements are cascaded down through through the entire supply chain because Airbus learned a few lessons over the last uh, over the last decades on what a tier three supplier deep down in the supply chain can do to the to the final assembly line. So, lots of requirements and different ways to go about that. What we do is, and I have to bring that up, uh, sorry about that, we, we offer guidance in becoming an aerospace supplier. We are currently at the webinar with you guys of the creating awareness, markets, developments and opportunities as much we can cover in a webinar. Uh, we have uh, as a follow-up, uh, we run that in cooperation with, with Edmonton Global. We have a seminar, the Airbus supply chain, half day seminar where we go further into, into detail on, on, on what, what's actually happening in, uh, in, in, take a deep dive into what's happening in, the, on, on, in those markets, uh, what should you focus on, um, or where we can even provide um, um, confidentiality, confidentiality uh, um, taking, to, taking into consideration uh, conf confidentiality issues, we have to, we can provide uh, insight into, okay, you have a specific product, uh, you, you have an innovative product, where could, how could that find its way into the supply chain? We can provide you guides for that. And from there, we can then, we have a, a range of, of services that, that, uh, um, that, will help you to move forward in becoming an aerospace uh, or even an Airbus supplier. Uh, so as a final step, we can, we can connect you with the, with, with the potential, with the potential buyers uh, and or the supplier network. That context, we have an upcoming seminar that uh, facilitates the strategic decision towards the aerospace supply chain. So when you think, uh, so you have a great innovative product and uh, I think there's potential for that, or I want to know more about the about uh, uh, opportunities in the, in the supply chain. Uh, we have that uh, upcoming seminar together with uh, Edmonton Global, half day seminar virtual classroom, where we uh, get much more details on the on the uh, Airbus supply chain. And with that, I thank you for your for for the time you uh, you you spent here and uh, for opening up that for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much for your information, Holger. Uh, that's a lot of information to cram into a short amount of time, and I'm sure there's plenty more. Uh, so we're looking forward to the next the next round. Um, I think I want to start off with one of my questions, and that is, uh, if I'm a company 
Uh, you mentioned 2022 when the uh, industrial technological benefits uh, program is, is coming into play. When should I as a vendor start getting started on getting ready for upcoming opportunities? Great, great question, Brent. It's, and it's a simple answer. You have to get started now. It's, that program is just around the corner and, and we have to make sure that, or for potential suppliers, you want to make sure that when you start a conversation with Airbus procurement, you have the right value proposition for them. They're being, Airbus procurement is being bombarded with proposals and, and opportunities to listen, we have this great project. If you don't have your value proposition right, if, uh, you're going to lose them. So you have to get started now. You have to take that strategic decision now. Okay, I want to know more about what's happening. Why is it happening? And what can I do as a, as a supplier to do, to do that? But that's a process where we have to get started now and not Please, it's, it's really, we don't, want, we don't want to waste anybody's time in having a supplier show up at, at a conference uh, and have a meeting with Airbus and then start with a value proposition that is unclear to Airbus. What's the value add to Airbus? What do you bring to the table? If you don't, if you don't have that in place, that's the end of the conversation with Airbus. As, harsh and as arrogant it might sound, but uh, that's really, there's so much, and we've seen that time over time over time again, there's great potentials in, in the Canadian, in the Canadian industry, but it's the value proposition where we find the most lack in, where, where we see, okay, great product, how can we translate that for procurement? And that's, that's a process that ha doesn't happen overnight. You have to know those requirements and get that going. Sorry, it wasn't a short answer, but the short answer is get started now. Speaking of, speaking of time, we do have uh, a number of questions in the chat. Uh, some of them you may have already covered in the, in the presentation, mm -hmm. but we most definitely would, wouldn't mind uh, repeating those and, and making sure that we, we, we get to the heart of the answer. Um, there's a question that says, uh, from Owen, I'm wondering about the implications of moving away from hub and spoke for aircraft maintenance. Would maintenance also become dispersed? Uh, for example, taking place at more dispersed airports or would aircraft still fly into a home base airports for maintenance periodically? You, you alluded a little bit to that talking about AI and maybe uh, parts being at the ready when an aircraft lands. Would you be able to elaborate a little bit more on that, Holger? Yeah, sure. So, so maintenance, <sighs> Maintenance happens where the aircraft is, right? So, so we have we have the the regular checks and the regular maintenance that that can be scheduled or is being scheduled uh, uh, far ahead of time. So that maintenance will not change. We'll still see we'll still see MTU Canada here in Vancouver. In Vancouver, we'll still have those we'll still have those maintenance hubs in in place. But we will see through the advent of 3D printing, as an example, we, we, we will see a more flexible approach on, 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 those MRO, on those MRO operations. So we will see an increase uh, on, on remote airports as well, because now all of a sudden we have this, this capability of, of providing the, the right part uh, already um, at, the, uh, at the destination airport and not risking uh, an aircraft on ground uh, situation where that aircraft can't leave because we're waiting, we're waiting for a part uh, being delivered from somewhere else. So, so we'll see an increase. Uh, uh, we'll we'll see an increase in in remote locations as well. While hubs will still remain the the brunt work of the uh, of of MRO. Okay, perfect. Uh, an anonymous attendee mm -hmm. asks. Uh, are all the potential parts and solutions that Airbus is looking for already spoken for, uh, provided by existing or so provided by existing suppliers? Uh, if so, is Airbus looking for a lower cost or more innovative options? I think you've you've touched base on this. Maybe we need to reiterate it. Or are there specific areas, uh, brakes, landing gear, avionics, carpet plastics that they are targeting? Okay, good question. 
Um, so, so has it been spoken for? No, um, because the program has not been awarded yet, right? So Airbus, it's very likely, very, very likely that Airbus uh, is, is going to get that, uh, that project. Uh, when that happens, then the process, the procurement process or the scouting process will, will start. Um, what we've seen in the past in 2016 was the last uh, ITB opportunity. Um, in, in the context of uh, search and rescue, fixed wing search and rescue, uh, those those uh, those opportunities are being awarded really quick, so it doesn't take long. So hence again, you want to have your value proposition right and 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 in time. In terms of in terms of commodities, uh, that really depends on as as a new supplier, I would. Uh, we recommend uh, you don't want to get started with a with a jet engine. Um, if if that's as a new supplier, it's very unlikely that that uh, that this is um, this is going to be a process that will be over in a few months. Very very unlikely because you need approvals from all different uh, from all different in the, uh, from all different directions. Um, where we see. Great opportunity, better opportunity is, uh, especially for new suppliers, is when you think about cabin and cargo. Uh, contra in contrast to propulsion and, and, and aerostructure in itself uh, for cabin and cargo, um, so let's say seats or, or uh, trolleys or anything that, that you as a passenger see from the inside of an aircraft, the regulations are, are Strict, but not as strict as as for for flying parts, uh, for 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 aerostructure and propulsion parts. So uh, much lower uh, lower hurdles to overcome, as especially as a new supplier. Some of the greatest suppliers, uh, Recaro seat suppliers or uh, or Zodiac, um, they who are now uh, tier one tier one suppliers. Uh, uh, Found their way through the cabin cabin environment into into the Airbus uh, into the Airbus supply chain. Okay, looking at time here, I think we might have time for two more questions. I'm going to jump to this one. Okay. Uh, it says Holger, thank you for all the information. Uh, for companies who are not already in aviation supply chains, this seem, can seem daunting. Uh, what should they consider, companies, as a first step? or first few steps if they're interested in connecting into or becoming a supplier within the supply chain? How do they need to act to get involved? What's the first step? Uh, who can they contact for details? And that's really, that's, that's uh, I hate to, hate to say, <laughs> that's what the supply chain, the, the seminar is all about. Uh, where we give you we give you much more detailed information uh, on on what are the requirements what are the how do you from a strategic point of view how do you approach that uh, we find that you know sometimes it's not it's not really desirable to be an Airbus tier one supplier where you directly deliver to the Airbus final assembly line as a matter of fact in most cases that's that will will most likely never happen anyhow. So, but you have to find your way into the supply chain. So find it through a sub-tier supplier, work with them, collaborate with them. And uh, that will open up so much more opportunities for, especially for those new suppliers that, that are willing to, or, or capable of bringing new ideas and new concepts into, into, uh, into the industry and, uh, and, and We've seen that in the past. That works really well for Airbus, and Airbus is is uh, encouraging new suppliers to do that. Thank you for that, Holger. Uh, you know what? I'm I'm just going to jump to hydrogen for a moment. Uh, you you mentioned hydrogen and innovation. It's most definitely uh, part of the Edmonton ecosystem now. Uh, you mentioned the next generation turbofans fans will run on hydrogen. Uh, what plans does Airbus have for integrating suppliers of hydrogen turbine engines into their supply chain? Well, I, I think from a, from an Edmonton regional uh, um, uh, 
for the opportunities for the Edmund region are probably limited when it comes to developing propulsion technology for hydrogen. What we're looking for, what we're looking for in Edmonton is really, well, at the end of the day, we need to have a reliable network, uh, reliable storage solution, solutions for, for hydrogen um, in terms of, uh, so that we can operate, that Airbus could operate a fleet, uh, a worldwide fleet uh, based, on, based on hydrogen. Propulsion engines, very tricky business. Uh, there's only a handful of players in that in that in that market, and uh, especially for new suppliers, I would not recommend to 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 do that right. Like if, if you think, unless you find something that runs on water, uh, different story. Um, that's very very challenging. Can be very very challenging uh, unless you have some great technology that where we can connect you with an engine manufacturer. Um, there's always an opportunity for that. Uh, we see in terms of, in terms of the uh, turbofan, um, I think there's, if there's probably the, the better opportunities for, for newcomers to the industry uh, on that aircraft, we can no longer right now with jet fuel that's being stored in the in, in either enter tanks or in the wings and hydro with hydrogen we no longer can do that we cannot store we cannot store hydrogen in the wings so um, innovative companies who come up with a great solution on that uh, I think that's something that has some potential but propulsion tricky business okay. um, and, and finally we have two minutes left so this one has to be brief but uh, you know, are there specific aerospace production approvals, uh, minimum certifications required for the A220 or, or various ITB requirements like an ISO 9005, controlled goods, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good question. Thank you. Um, that really depends. It depends on the commodity you're, you're, you're going into. One big requirement you always have to fulfill when you're in the Airbus supply chain, you have to be 9100 certified. So that's the quality management, uh, that's the quality management approval that you need to have in place. So it's an extension of the 9001, uh, 9100 certified, that's 9001 plus aerospace requirements. And uh, um, as far as other approvals go, that really depends on the specific product you have. It depends on, on the program itself. Uh, A220, you're under Canadian regulations, and the A320, you're under European regulations. But that's all that we bring across in the, uh, in the uh, uh, su supply chain seminar. So yes, there are, there are uh, certifications and approvals, uh, but we'll guide you through that. Uh, we'll make it as painless as possible for you. Perfect. Holger, thank you so much again for your time today. Uh, fantastic information. Um, we're going to take this webinar that has been recorded and we're going to distribute it to all of those uh, in attendance today. Uh, if there are any other questions for Edmonton Global or, or Holger about becoming a supplier for Airbus, please do reach out. Uh, as Holger mentioned, this is uh, this is stage one in, in, in bringing on suppliers. Uh, we'll have a subsequent webinar that'll be half a day into the future and we'll reach out directly uh, to have attendees for that webinar. Um, Holger, have yourself a very happy Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? <laughs> Have yourself a very yes. happy Tuesday. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees today. We hope to hear from you soon. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.